from that kind of question, the other one, I I think you mentioned it already. I know we've mentioned it like eight times when we discussed him, but TJ Control. What is, can, what does that can mean? you just explain that? <laughs> just teach me. Uh, okay. Okay. I, I think, you know, I'm going to give you non-engineer terms, non-engineer <laughs> terms. I'll, I'll give you the Dell version. Then let's let Mark talk to this in a bit, because I think this will be great for Intel to talk to the history here and what it means. The CPU temperature is important from a reliability standpoint. And so as the power is going into the transistors, they're flipping, it creates heat from friction. It comes out of the system itself. And we have to keep the temperature of the die within spec to ensure it can operate over the life of the product. And historically, we control to a TJ Maxx. So when Intel gives us the data or the documentation, it will say, hey, Travis, we got this great new part. This new part has all these E and P cores. Here's the thermal resistance. Here's the power. And here's the temperature spec. We go in based upon that temperature spec, and it's typically TJ Maxx. And we control off of that TJ Maxx temperature to build the whole system. Now, there's a lot of confusion in the market because historically, from a, a temperature perspective, everybody in their head has it, hey, lower is better from a, a overall cooling perspective. But from a modern control with CPUs that can turbo, if typical power is 45 watts, but this part can go to 130 as an example, under turbo, and that's just an example, it's not a specific value, what happens is you get very large delta T swings. So historically, where you were used to seeing temperatures in the 50 to 70 range, maybe up to 80, legacy, 5, 10 years ago, back to Haswell, pre-Haswell, now you're going to see temperatures that hug much closer to TJ Maxx. And that's on purpose. It is to maximize performance at runtime. So temperature TJ means the junction temperature. It's literally the junction within the silicon itself. And they've got a bunch, and I'm not going to go into this because there's a <laughs> bunch of sensors within the silicon, but basically that's what we control off of. That tells us Dell, yep, you're doing a good job. I'm where I need to be. You're not overcooling, so we're not wasting it in space, form factor, and size. And yep, you're doing a good job from a performance perspective. Now, if we go beyond that, there is a ton of controls within the CPU itself that optimized based upon anything from an excursion standpoint, that's power, that's temperature. Um, and I'd say Mark can go into this a little better than I can. All right. I love the handoffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll work on that. We'll get it, we'll get it smoother by the, by the time we're done. Um, so actually, um, John, I sent you some visuals that yeah, we can show as, as we can talk through and, and help. And, and as Travis mentioned, right, like the, the old ways of doing things are the traditional methods and vocabularies that people use. Like these have been around for a few decades. Um, and what I'm showing here on this page, there's two different uh, CPUs. On the left-hand side, we've got the Pentium 3 that was launched in 2001. Um, it's just a single core. Uh, this uh, particular part product, this was back when we still had a discrete uh, memory controller and a discrete I.O. controller in the system. Uh, so we just had that single die sitting there. It was just one core with its cache. Uh, that ran at 29 watts. And so at that point in time, uh, I don't even remember if we had turbo or maybe we were just introducing turbo technologies at that point. Um, so when you turn on the system, that CPU would go up to 29 watts and it would sit there, right? So we would design those systems to be only on the most extreme workloads that could fully consume that 29 watts would they be up at that 100 degrees or TJ Maxx limit that Travis was mentioning. Right. And that's what everybody was used to. So if you ran a, a workload that wasn't as demanding as the worst case workload that exists on the planet, you wouldn't be consuming the 29 watts. You'd be at something lower than that. So your yeah. average temperature would be less. Right. Now, on the right hand side, I'm showing Alder Lake. And this was um, Alder Lake S. We launched it last year. Um, this one is, if you notice, these two pictures are to scale. Um, so we've got quite a bit more die size here, um, but I also am showing a power range, and that's 125 to 240 watts, right? That's how we're now showing or specking our parts is we're, we're really embracing the dynamic frequency range that we have available as well as what that means in terms of the power dissipation of the part. Um, but if you go to the next page, what I'm showing that we have happening here is we took that single core, right? And now we have eight of those cores on there, right? And you notice that that core, the total area in the core, that shrank 90% over those two decades from all the process node improvements that's that we've wild had. wild looking. Like actually right, seeing crazy. it laid out that yeah. way. I don't yeah, think I've ever actually... seen that I don't... kind of a breakdown before of how much, like if you look at what is it, like the, the one section of the memory is the size of the core was before. Yeah, Did we and... see this before? Because I don't remember seeing this image. <laughs> yeah. Because like yeah. that's that's pretty impressive. I'm not gonna it lie. Is. 
No, I yeah. mean, like, I work here, and this is something that's been <laughs> in my head. Like, I know that we've done, but it wasn't until I put this picture together. Like, whoa, that's actually really cool, right? I mean, this, yeah. is, this is Moore's Law in action right there. Um, but when when we shrink everything down, right, we still have one of those cores. If I just do the math simply, right, I've got 10 cores on there. I've got eight big cores, and then I've got two clusters of small cores at the bottom. And we can talk about those in a little bit. Um, but each of those cores, if I if I divide that 241 by 10, just to make the math easy, right, that's still 24 watts that I'm now putting into a much, much smaller area. And when I run workloads, I don't always run every single core simultaneously, right? So depending on how the software has been written, how many threads the software is taking advantage of or, or utilizing, I might actually assign a bunch of work just to a single core. So I'm going to run that core at the highest frequency I can in order to give the best performance. But that also means I've put a lot more power into a very small area. Yeah. Um, right. So now if you go to the next page, this is where we get into what Travis and I are actually doing on Friday night. <laughs> it's it's Matt. fabulous. <laughs> Matt. Yay. Yes. Right. So, so this is what I'm showing is on, on, on the equation on the left for those that are really interested, right? This is, this is a simplification of the actual physics, right? This is basically just a lumped capacitance model. I like that. This um, is the simplification. Yeah, this is, this is the easy one. Um, and But basically what it's saying is that the temperature response has an exponential aspect to it, right? So, and you see that over in the graph on the right. And what I'm showing on the right-hand side is the temperature response for different power levels um, for the same system, right? And the blue line, the power P, that was what we used to do traditionally, where we would design a system for, um, for let's say, that 29 watts, right? And if you turned on the system, you started exercising the CPU, it would literally take tens of minutes before you would actually go up and saturate um, at that final temperature, the 100 degrees C. But when we started introducing turbo technology and as we've expanded on that and expanded our dynamic frequency range, like we realized there's a lot of workloads that are a lot shorter in duration than that 100 or 200 seconds. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's take advantage of that. Let's push those cores to higher frequency levels. Let's get the job work done faster. And this is where you start seeing the, the 1.25p was is roughly 25% more power than what we had initially. Right. So that was those were the early days of turbo. Mm -hmm. And then as we've gone further, right now we go much, much more higher, much higher power capability, more than the system can sustain. But you notice like the 4p where I'm doing four times as much power as that system can sustain. I'm bumping into the temperature limit in a matter of seconds, yeah. right? And so, so this is what we're seeing now, and you see this especially on the mobile systems where we're putting a lot more power into the CPU than the system can sustain indefinitely. So you're seeing, yeah, if I've, if I've got a, a high activity on a handful of the cores, my reported temperature, because we report the maximum on the CPU or the maximum on the die is going to be close to that limit. But again, like, we have all the controls in place. We're not going to overshoot it. We'll reduce frequency as we need to. Um, but it's it's all around making sure we're maximizing the performance and and giving every or basically taking every last bit of margin out of the yeah. system and taking advantage of it. 